Good. <laughs> Meeple syrup. Hey. Welcome, everybody, to the Meeple Syrup Show. My name is Sen. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm here live from London, Ontario, Canada. And it's a Thursday night, and we're glad to have some very special guests with us tonight. Uh, Wesley McGee Saxon and Rachel Voss. And hey, Erica, what's up? I have a dog that keeps going from door to door. <laughs> so one second. That's what's up. Apparently the dog's here. She's a very cute dog. So I She's mean. the next. I'm back. Okay. You're back. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I hear I have to email you at a different email address now. What's up with that? Oh, well, yeah. If you want, if you want me to work on something that's related, yeah. So I've got my my fancy new Spin Master uh, email address, and look, I have a new phone now. If someone wants to explain to me how to hang on to two phones all the time, I would love some advice because <laughs> this is a little weird. That is weird. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Well, you know, now that you're a corporate shill, there you go. <laughs> Got you got all the gear. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. Very cool. Uh, Erica, for those of you who don't know, has started at Spin Master or will start at Spin Master like next week. No, or I officially like started that. on Monday. I'm already doing oh, stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, there you go. Mr. Lang and I are even working together on something. So, yeah. Awesome. Is that the sidekicks thing? Yes. Okay. So cool. It's a bit announced. I can say that. I can oh, say no, those yeah, words. It's announced. <laughs> it's announced. So, I'll, I, that's, I'll, I'm going to be on that. Do you get to tell Eric what to do? <laughs> We're like poking Eric to be like, did you make a decision? Because you're running out of time. <laughs> also, also good. Also good to, to I like the running that. you want because it's your last chance. So at least I can say that. <laughs> That's it. Uh, all right. So Wes and Rachel are two people who were recommended by our other good friend, Daniel Rocky, who is a teacher in the same system that you taught in, Erica, in the, the uh, Toronto me, District yeah. Yeah, um, School Board. And one day, um, Daniel said, hey, you need, like, need, like, he was like, you need to talk to Wesley. I said, okay, well, let's do something. Uh, and it's taking a little while to schedule everybody to get together, but Wesley's here and Rachel's here. Re Wesley and Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself? We'll start with Wesley. Okay, so hi, folks. Uh, my name is Wes or Wesley. It doesn't matter. I use he and they pronouns. Either or is fine. You can use both. It's wonderful. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of an organization we will be talking about called Forge Ahead, a party to access. And yes, I was a past student of Daniel's. I went to high school where he taught. He was my English teacher. So that's how this whole thing got started. Oh, was yeah. my English and my drama teacher. So we would spend lunch periods in the library going over monologues for auditions and such. And I got to see his mountain of board games in the school library. So, yeah. There you go. We have our first message to you. That. I hope he's watching. Um, but... Wallace Cat, uh, who is a... Uh, who I, actually, it's hilarious. I just almost messaged you because I was trying to message Erica and your name popped up when I typed your name in for some reason. Uh, Wallace says, as a dad of a sweet young boy with differences, and his kid is super sweet, uh, he loves you all and loves this episode. He is... Uh, very much interested in what you have to say. Yeah, he also up. he also knows Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they only live like a few blocks from each other. They so. do. Oh, Daniel Rocky, what a good man he is. We all live very close to each other, as people know. Oh, that's awesome! And look who's here. Oh, yeah, I see, here. I see. He's here in the <laughs> chat. I'm very yeah. excited. We miss you, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, we miss both of you, Wallace and Daniel. Wallace being it's, Dennis. Oh, really. it's so weird to think like we're not all gonna be at like. Gen Con or something like that, where just like everybody's there. You know what I mean? It is remarkably odd. It is remarkably odd. I mean, I we weren't there last year. Canadian. Sorry to derail this. I just occurred to me that I'm like, ah, oh, hmm. when was the last time we actually saw each other? Even though we like, live in the same city, it's just weird because, you know, the way things are. So, Wes, you got your start um, under the auspices of. Uh, Mr. Rocky at the time, I guess, uh, in <laughs> drama and English. And how did that lead you to become a gamer? Or were you a gamer before that? So here's the thing. Um, I've been playing video games for about as, as, as soon as I was like three, four, picking right. up a Nintendo 64 controller, um, playing Smash Bros. Um, and... For 64. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, I'm having an moment right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you could say I'm one of the younger ones on the call. Um, and my, my brother and I used to play together a lot. And just as, as I got older and I got more into fantasy, sci-fi, all those kind of adventure stories, uh, video games kind of served as a bit of an escape for me of like moments where I could, you know, really dive into something, uh, experience a story, leave my body for a little bit. I had, I had and still have uh, moments when I play video games uh, where I'm going up and down stairs and mm -hmm. I just choose to go up and down stairs several times just because I can and it's great and I love it. Awesome. Um, I feel like Claptrap from Borderlands a lot of the time. Uh, with stairs, we have a very similar relationship. Um, so, <laughs> two yeah, stairs, I, yeah, two stairs <laughs> yeah, in general. I get it. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've been a gamer for as long as I can remember, pretty much. That's tabletop's awesome. a different story, though. I got yeah. into tabletop a couple years ago. Okay, and uh, oh my god, tabletop. <laughs> Nobody owned an Odyssey system, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel's Daniel's actually older than you are I am. Snowflake. <laughs> well, he's just older than I am. <laughs> No, just a lot of people didn't buy the Odyssey. Oh yeah, no Odyssey. Really Odyssey was uh, was Odyssey the, the like the Magnavox one or whatever. Yeah. What about the Vetra Vextrex? Do you remember the Vectrex? The, I, the Vectra like, one. Like, I didn't own these, but I'm like I'm familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um, own I owned Atari and NES to start. So that's that's like you know. NES came out when I was like two or three. I want to say. Yeah, I think we ha well we uh, Carrie had one when she was. I think six and her brother was five so around yeah there. like i remember getting that for christmas with like the gyroscope robot and like everything else oh wow with bob oh my dad went all out because he really wanted it for himself <laughs> <laughs> dads will do that yeah i actually still have i have all my systems still yeah so. that sounds about right <laughs> eric is like that you work I yeah and, and so wes you when did you start when did you start in tabletop and what what actually drove you to say, I want to play a role-playing game. So here, here's the thing. Um, I, as as a career choice and as a schooling choice, I went to Wexford Collegiate School for the Arts in Toronto, uh -huh. which is where I met Daniel, and that's where all the fun started. Um, and because they were a school with an adaptable a program that supports students with disabilities, uh, it was encouraged that I auditioned for their drama program because I'm apparently dramatic somewhat. Uh, <laughs> Rachel will be able to tell you that. Um, but uh, from then, I spent four years at Wexford, and then I went to York University in their acting conservatory program for uh, theater and for acting for the stage. So I guess you could say in terms of schooling, I got pretty hardcore into role play, right. if that's what you want to call it, yeah, no um, doubt. For, for a career choice. And I want to get into voice acting and like acting for film and stage, all that fun stuff. Um, I had always wanted to get into D&D. &D. Um, I didn't really have enough friends who were interested until I got to uni. Right. Um, so when I went, uh, when I came back for my second year, I said, okay, that's it. I really want to find a D&D &D group and play a D&D &D group. And I found one and immediately fell in love with it because there are no like coding restrictions if I wanted right. to be a character in a wheelchair, I could be a character in a wheelchair. Uh, if I wanted to be whatever I wanted to be, I could. And if I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do, I could. So, um, and now I use it as a way to practice different voices and accents and all that fun jazz to keep myself sharp in that way. Yeah. So that's how I got my start, I suppose. That's excellent. And Rachel, what about you? What's your origin story? Um, well, my name is Rachel Voss. Um, I use she and her pronouns. And um, I guess um, my like, I've always been a super nerd. Um, I was very fortunate enough that my sister, um, who's like 13 years older than I am, so she's always like just been there. Um, her husband, um, well, has like his family owns like a comic book shop or like a game shop. Nice. And oh. um, so I basically I just like went those. there. Yeah, it was so much fun. I was like a shop. Can kid. I date your brother in law? I, I, I'll date your brother in law. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I support it. Sure. Um, you'd have to come to, to Illinois, though. Oh, um, that's the only mm. thing. No. <laughs> um, I know. I feel that. But um, 
Uh, so I would go there and I'd like help work out, like do festivals and um, cons and stuff. And um, so I just kind of guess fell in love with the nerd culture. And um, then uh, I went to uh, the University of Illinois for uh, wheelchair basketball. I attended, I was on the wheelchair basketball team there. And um, I moved in with my uh, current uh, DM who, um, she was my roommate. And so she was just like, you know what, you live here. So you're going to play. Um, and so <laughs> she um, made me make a character, which was Sa Nata'ana. Um, and we only played um, that campaign. It was a 3.5 uh, D&D campaign. We played it like a couple sessions and then 5e came out. And so we like relearned everything <laughs> basically. Your character and- still exist in the 5e? <laughs> That's always a fun uh, one when you're like, um, okay, so I don't technically really exist anymore. So I'm going to do this instead. <laughs> Pretty much. I am having some like auto issue or like I think connection issues, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's basically how, um, I started in, um, gaming and I actually didn't think about adding myself as, um, like in like a, like a character that used a wheelchair. I don't know why I ever like didn't think about it, but, um, uh, so my characters always had um, were typically developed until I saw the Strata Miniatures minis um, and that were uh, made from uh, Sarah Thompson's or Mustang Arts uh, uh, combat chair rules. And so once that happened, that's when like my brain just went in a completely different direction. It's, it's like the Fire Nation attacked the world. Yeah, thing. exactly. It, it t- 100%. <laughs> well, it's really dark. I think this seems like it went a lot lighter. <laughs> Well, I mean, so um, Erica, no, Erica knows that uh, we're interviewing Sarah Thompson in a couple of weeks about that. So I, I think it's just amazing that Sarah's work has touched the lives that it has in the way that it has. And I mean, I shouldn't be amazed by that, but I am still amazed by it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I love that it has such a positive effect. And I hate that it has such negative feedback from some people, uh, mm. which which is really disheartening and it must be uh disheartening i know it's disheartening for her um that you know you get such negative feedback about something that's just supposed to be positive and inclusive like or just is it shouldn't even be a topic of discussion it just is why 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 is this a big deal for everybody (laughs) yeah why do do, do we need your opinion on this you know what i mean right sometimes (laughs) it's true yeah yeah but yeah, we were we started because of those opinions and those com- the comment sections were terrible yeah, when they first they started. Awful. And it, it it's really what fueled terrible. us so much to be able to just like come together and be like, you know what, we need to do something. And like the the combat share rules are amazing and we need to support them as much as possible. So that's yeah. what we decided to do right. randomly. Randomly. Um and so so forged ahead is really born out of this very recent movement um, in tabletop role-playing games of inclusion uh, and inclusion for visible disabilities uh, where there's actually like tools in the game to have like a wheelchair that is rigged for Mm -hmm. dungeoneering. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Forged Ahead, and and I know now we don't know why you're doing it, but what exactly are you doing, and how are you getting the word out to people? Do you, do you want to take this, Rachel? Or do you want yeah, to- I'll take this one. Okay, um, sure. So one of the um, we are on social media, um, mainly Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're going to branch out to other things as well, like Twitter. I know the Twitter section for dun- like D and D and stuff should be where we're at, but. I'm not ready there for that yet. <laughs> well, I was gonna um, say, you know what? It's the it is when you've got the fan base to support you. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I mean, I feel like it's just like waiting for blood in the water on Twitter half the time. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're being very treated nicely on Instagram. So that's where we're mainly at right now. But yeah. um, what we're trying to do is make mechanics or um, specifically right now characters with uh, disabilities that people can use to model their own characters or play as um, characters or NPCs, whatever, for their own campaigns so that they can have accurate representation of people with disabilities and um, start to shift the idea of what a wheelchair is, shift the idea of what mobility aids are and what they can be, especially in fantasy and when magic is involved. 
Right. Yeah. And Magic science, that, whatever it that is. applies to mm -hmm. dexterity as well. Like we're shifting how even the stats are thought of in relation to disabilities. So Great. we're doing, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're writing a lot of articles in terms of advocacy and, you know, uh, talking to members of our communities to develop those characters. Um, right. Like we're basing a lot of the characters that we have released and are going to release are either based on ourselves or based on our friends um, right. with disabilities. And they have had uh, like full creative control over those characters. We just, uh, we, we know the mechanics, we know how to sort of homebrew stuff. So they come to us with ideas and we throw them in a blender and come out with something amazing. So Wes, tell me, what are some of the ideas that ha that your friends have come to you with? I saw so, one that I thought was great. The, uh, the, the, um, oh, oh, the service the animal. Brain. Oh, oh, the service animal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can have familiars, right? <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. Um, I, I talked to, uh, Rachel about wanting to do a service animal thing because in my last campaign, um, my DM was kind enough to gift me a blink dog for a service animal, yeah. which was amazing because I actually have a service dog who is asleep beside me. <laughs> and uh, I want to, I love bringing her into uh, campaigns because we have a very, very special bond that I would say goes beyond any pet that you might have because I literally depend on her for survival when I'm alone as much as she depends on me. Um, and I have always wanted to bring them in game and I've had uh, varying experiences with DMs being ready or willing to include a service dog in a game in a meaningful way, mainly because they weren't really aware of how, you know, how service dogs can work in terms of what tasks they do, how they support different people. So uh, Rachel and I had the wonderful idea to say, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna come up with uh, content for this. We're gonna sort of do a how-to guide on service dogs and different ways they could be implemented and applied to different animals, that kind of thing. That's amazing. I love it. I think it's so interesting to to think about, you know, <laughs> I mean, because all GMs drop stat blocks for monsters all the time or characters mm -hmm. all the time. So what's the difference between that and a service animal? Oh, Which is, like know. you said, basically, Erica is a familiar. Yeah, there's so many animals built in the game. Can't you just slightly change up maybe either how they're activated, how long they can be present, how you can, whatever it is, aren't you just kind of, you know, like maybe like either restatting or slightly homebrewing just essentially what's already in the game it's weird I mean, to be maybe a little averse to it when it literally exists and that's what they're they're for to be service animals effectively yeah i mean i also had experience where a, a dm just wasn't you know just wasn't down to clown in general and i didn't ah. i didn't i didn't stay with that group for very long um, for for those there. reasons but you know um, and we tried to make the, cause with all the disability related content that we are creating, like we are taking it and making it fantastical, making it all D and D cause that's the system that we're using. But at the same time, we want to marry the fact that the disability stuff we're creating, uh, is true to life as much as it is fantastical. So right. yeah, we could have just taken a familiar stat block and been like, service dog boom but we also it's wanted to yeah. identify how service dogs help people in in real life in our reality and directly transpose that so that folks would be able to say this is not a familiar this is my service animal mm -hmm. we wanted right. to so differentiate the two yeah smart uh rachel can you tell us about the four pillars of a party to access you have four of them. What are they, and why did why do these become your pillars? Um, so when we first started, um, when we first talked, it was just kind of a random en encounter in some random Facebook group. I had created the Chairsmith tools and shared it in the group, and um, he had responded, or and like it was just that's how we started. 
Um, and so when we, when we first started talking, we really wanted to have a focus. We wanted to make sure that it just wasn't like, like I have ADHD, so I was prepared to make it seem like we all have ADHD in um, the forge, but we needed to have um, focus and the four pillars were the things that um, focused us. So um, one being education, we wanted to make sure that we were advocacy and that we were educating people more than just making um, a prosthetic eye. We wanted to teach people exactly what goes into making a prosthetic eye. Um, and so that was the main point of um, education. Community outreach is a huge um, factor. We wanted to um, meet, reach as many gamers with disabilities specifically as possible um, because disability isn't a monolith of perspectives and everyone has um, a different view um, depending on their life circumstances and all intersectionalities. Yeah. And so um, being able to um, make sure that us two white presenting uh, disabled folks aren't the only ones being heard on the forge was extremely important for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then mechanics, uh, which would be those service dog mechanics, um, anything that would be um, just, uh, we have disability bonus mechanics um, as well. Right. Different things. Which I thought um, was super cool. Yeah, um, that one, up. I love the bonus mechanics because a lot of the yeah. stuff that we were seeing were was very much like taking negatives yes. and making them into a positive when really we do have positives. Um, per, like Just to go through it, like perception. Um, people with disabilities are often the, and the people who work with people with disabilities are often the ones to see that something's wrong, that there's a shift in behavior, that something has changed, and that is so vital in combat. And um, so that should be um, something that is um, rewarded for your characters with disabilities. I currently have a broken rib. Um, so one of like one of the things that we talk about is how we have like higher constitution, um, mm. just because of the fact that like we're so used to like pain or like pain, feeling discomfort, and stuff. all that stuff. I yeah. didn't know I had a broken rib for like six weeks. Like um, so, like it's partly because of just like the way that my disability is, but also partly just because I'm used to it. Yeah, I'm used, and so like it's it's something that you could like. You can quantify, you can see, especially in like a tabletop game. Right. Pain um, tolerance is high for, for a lot of us because we often experience a lot of varying types of chronic or acute pain yeah, for as sure. a result of our disabilities. So we thought that that could translate super well into like beefy constitution scores. <laughs> it makes sense. It absolutely does. I, I don't know. Not a lot of people on the show know this. I've had uh, chronic pain issues my entire life, like to the point where I had, I mean, daily headaches before I was seven and they've never stopped. So rather than being on meds your whole life, you really do have to start to learn pain coping mm -hmm. uh, just because mm -hmm. you can't be on the stuff they want to stick you on all the time. It's just not possible. So I have the exact same story of you. I didn't break a rib, by the way, but that really hurts. I've fractured my wrist and other things and had no idea. Oh, yeah. Just because your divided attention for pain is just so different. Yeah. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like on an analog scale, we often, you know, ask people, it's on a scale of one to 10, where's your pain? And you just kind of want to say, well, for you, yeah, the, well, this might be a 12, but for me, it's a six. question. If you talk to anyone with chronic pain, they're like, yeah, <laughs> Do we, uh, I don't think you know what you just asked, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. And in terms of the pain coping, thank you for bringing that up, Erica. I just wanted to mention also, not all of, not everyone with a disability in terms of geolocation, intersectionality, class, socioeconomic status, not everyone has access to the medication needed to manage chronic pain yes. or stuff like that. Having a disability is wicked expensive. And unfortunately, uh, like even as, Speaking from my perspective, as a white, non-binary, but very mask-presenting person, like I have a lot of privilege in terms of healthcare, and I still find it really, really difficult to sometimes get uh, get care that I require. So I can only imagine what it might be like for more marginalized disabled folks, and that's why we develop these methods of weird forms of dexterity, weird forms of uh, 
pain coping, all that different kind of stuff. We have to, to survive. Oh, let alone what, you know, testing out to see which ones are going to work and then finding out what they're going to do to your organs over time on top of it. That so takes that, was- that takes con- so much constitution just to even be like, all right, I'm going to try this and put it in your body. Like that takes through the withdrawal of what this is going to feel like. Oh, yeah. It feel like crap. Yeah. yeah. We, we love um, that. Yeah, I love that cycle, <laughs> man. So the, the, the yeah, fourth, yeah. I should say the fourth yeah, the pillar fourth um, is world building. Um, so the, the one great thing about adding disability into uh, fantasy and gaming is that it creates so much more storytelling. It sure. creates so much more depth and um, adventure and understanding of what actually it is to be a being in a, in a world, you know? Um, and so uh, it's just world building is we have some huge plans for world building um that we can't really discuss right now even though i really really want to yeah. um well, we can't wait it's coming. It's we'll, coming. we'll have yes, you back on to coming. talk about it yes yes that would yes. be so lovely we're we're in progress on some really funky stuff but stay tuned uh we've been doing a lot of writing lately for some really cool stuff we think you're going to enjoy that's awesome um, it, 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 you will be able to see little teasers of that as we're going to do, um, if you've seen Kipo, we're going to Scarlamane a lot of that content. <laughs> so we're, go- we're nice. going to hint at some of that. Very good. Turn Scarlamane into a verb. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you are interested in looking at what uh, Wes and Rachel have currently on a party to access.com, go check it out. It's awesome. There's lots of really cool stuff on there. Like you could, you could have like a, a, a job as a chairsmith, right? That's so cool. I love uh, you're that the idea. person who like makes them and repairs them and all that kind of stuff. That was my job very uh, for a long time. I, I was uh, a person who fit wheelchairs for a very long time. Mm-hmm. So you know yeah, exactly yeah. how awesome. important I know, that I know, fit of a yeah. chair is. Yeah, I know exactly how important that is. <laughs> um, this. So tell me. Oh, I got the thing. Tell me a little bit about. Um, you know, I, I think I understand your philosophy, uh, Wes and Rachel. But what I want you to talk about maybe is how people with, you know, temporary able-bodied people need to change their philosophy uh, in order to see more of the world that really exists around us in terms of, you know, people with disabilities are all over the place. And, you know, there's lots of people who have disabilities that we don't even know they have disabilities. If you, if you just look at them, you wouldn't know. No, no. Uh, and then there's very visible, you know, cause they're in a wheelchair and that's very visible or, you know, use a walker or canes or crutches. But what's the philosophy, the philosophical change you hope people would have when you're, you know, you release the big world that you're thinking of, or when people see things like the uh, wheelchair, the combat wheelchair, what's the philosophical change you want to impart upon people? Uh, Wes, do you want to answer that one? And then we'll give, well, I, give I think we can definitely both, both take this one because uh, it was very, it was very interesting when we first got together as co-founders of the forge, we had a period where we did have um, some differing viewpoints on like how disability representation should be handled in terms of, um tabletop gaming so like if you're interested in reading about those perspectives in a lot of detail like it's on our social it's on our website please read it check it out um but in terms of like what i wish people knew about people with disabilities first and foremost we exist everywhere absolutely everywhere everywhere there is civilization we exist Another thing is that we thrive on interdependence. This is not the fact that we are entirely dependent on people. That is not what I'm trying to say. We thrive on interdependence. We as individuals with disabilities are experts at being able to foster community networks and being able to form reciprocal relationships with those around us to achieve self-actualization. So um, one thing that constantly myths me about typically developed people is they get hung up on asking for help, right? Like yeah. if, if you need help with something, ask for ask. it. Like I need, I need help to shower. I need help to dress, right? 
Like that's normal for me. And you know, um, we just we just get used to sort of giving what we can bring to the table, and it uh, it sort of gives us the ability to have insight in terms of building those relationships, fostering webs of community, and sort of being the glue that holds communities together. So one of the main reasons why I got into acting and like why I was really driven was because I didn't see anybody with my intersectionality on screen that wasn't portrayed in like a super campy kind of, um, I don't know if you've heard the term before, but uh, we, we like to call it inspiration porn. Yep. Like, let's say I was just shopping for groceries and I pick out an apple and someone walks up to me and says, oh, you're so inspiring. Like, I, I've, been, I've, been eat, I've been eating at McDonald's before and I've had people give me $5 bills. And it's like, okay, um, nope. They're trying to be um, nice but don't see the insult. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're too lawful good to, to too, recognize. Too lawful them. good. Absolutely. Too lawful good. Um, and I guess the big thing for me is that we exist... And if we if we do something super cool, like if, if we're doing something like if we're doing something that you would consider inspiring from a typically developed person, great. Then we're inspiring. Right. Wonderful. If we are just getting up to exist, we are not. And then also the fact that like we are capable of doing almost everything, um, like typically developed folks can do. We just might need some more adaptation around that. And of course, depending on your intersectionality of disability, you're gonna have different experiences. Um, but just for just to throw in a quick example before I toss it to Rachel, because I know Rachel has some fantabulous stuff to say about this. Um, I have been a martial artist for, wow, um, okay. 15 years, Taekwondo. Awesome. Um, I'm I'm looking into I'm looking into Irish stick fighting now because I'm I'm looking into something that is uh, that is from my cultural heritage as well. So I, I was interested oh, in that seeing what McGee Sachs. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, the Irish McGee. Look at that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I I've been a student of Taekwondo for uh, 15, almost 16 years now. Wow. That's awesome. Um, and I've been training under uh, Grandmaster Manalik Cahill here in Toronto. Um, and he, he and a couple other instructors sort of took me under their wing when I was younger. And uh, we've been spending years and a lot of time looking at various styles that he knows and he's aware of to develop a way of fighting that actually utilizes my wheelchair. Right. Um, and like I've, I've written an article on this on the website, check out our website. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, just in terms of being able to adapt a style that was mainly reliant on legs and kicking for someone that doesn't have that and also doesn't have sideways mobility. So like that, that's just one example. Like I want to write and star in, uh, you know, like your cheesy campy martial arts action flick like at it. some point. Just sure. so there can be several scenes of me being being what some folks would call a cripple. I love reclaiming that term, so I might use that term when I describe myself. Um, what some folks might see as a crippled person, absolutely like wrecking stunt people and stuff like that, <laughs> just in, in movies and stuff like that. I'm 100% down for that kind of thing. Rachel, I know you have fantastic stuff to say, so I'm going to throw it over to you because I've been yapping for uh, a little bit. So go ahead. Um, I mean, for myself, um, I guess to take the, a recent project, just as an example to, to talk about it, Rain Vosgrove is the character that I based off of myself. Um, and she was our first NPC, and um, she's on our website as well. But um, I wanted – she – is actually it's a duo um it's her and then flux is a mimic and mim is, flux is her chair um so um i really wanted the like chair itself to be a tool for freedom and independence not something because one of the things that we hate so much is when people call us like we're confined to a wheelchair or bound oh, to a yeah. wheelchair those it just words. It, yeah. It, yeah those little microaggressions that make it seem that like 
we are stuck. It's a jail sentence. Like we are like miserable when really the mm-hmm. wheelchair itself is a tool that gives mm-hmm. us freedom. It gives us mobility and it's not something we're stuck in. It's something that we're very grateful to have. So shifting that, um, that perspective of, like I said, I already said this before, shifting that perspective of what a wheelchair can be, um, what crutches can be, um, is really what I really want to do. I want one of the things that I love on our Instagram and Facebook is that we do every Friday a new piece of equipment that um, we use IRL so that um, people can start thinking about how they would put it in fantasy worlds. Right. So like kinesio tape, um, adding yeah. magic or si- more science to kinesio tape, what would that do? Um, yes. Sled hockey sticks that um, have like the pointy ends on the side. So like they're they short are terrifying and, and sharp. They, they are, are terrifying and sharp. You can stab people with them. <laughs> there's your spear right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's definitely like a wheelchair itself can be a weapon. Um, I like one of the things that I hated the most um, in the comment sections is people that use wheelchairs can't have dead or produce deadly force. And um, so I just like wanted to like take do a video at some point and take like a cantaloupe and just smash it against my chair um, like or something like Roll that. It over. Like, you know, I yeah. remember, like, watch those YouTube videos of cars squishing things. Just turn it around yeah. and be like wheelchairs squishing things. That yeah. Should, like, <laughs> eat it. You, you, can a lot of, you might get a lot of views. <laughs> hey, if a car can do it, why not? Yeah, for the folks at home as well, like my my electric wheelchair without me in it weighs something around like 300 pounds. I don't know what that is for whether Americans use a different unit of measurement. Well, they, 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 they've got that. They're, they're got that. We got that. We're, we, 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 yeah. we always have that. And like with, with me, I'm I'm something around 140. Wow, I just set my weight live on the internet. Whoa, look at me. Um, <laughs> but uh, like imagine like. 300 plus 140, 440 pounds of force going over your feet. Wear steel toes. Mm-hmm. I, I've i had yeah, that. You're gonna have some, yeah, you're going to have some broken toes. Sen, Sen knows what I'm talking about. I, yeah. Absolutely. And on the flip side of that, my manual wheelchair is about 23 pounds without the cushion. I could chuck that. I am extremely strong. And if someone like knocked me out of my chair, I'm going to grab my chair and use it as a weapon because I can. Yeah. Um, so like they're like wheelchairs are weapons. You could pop the wheels I, off and go like Captain American style. Well, yeah. I used to do um, white crane uh, Kung Fu and it has intentionally built into it very wacky, like literally household objects, like cane, whatever it is. That would actually, they also do bench. So yeah. what you could do bench style would be the same thing what you could do if you picked up a chair yeah you know what i mean like there's a lot of stuff like that you don't realize there are seated you know martial art forms and techniques there are those things to exist 100 percent, and you could do them with all of these devices i think the the main thing right now is that it's a like my, one of the things I love saying is when you view the world through walking feet, you're blinded by the path that was designed for you. Um, nice. So like right now in tabletop gaming and spe- specifically a year ago um, when Sarah released this stuff, um, everyone was like, no, I'm in my lane. I'm on the path that designed for me. I, I don't understand how your path is actually existing or working, but until they're able to step off of that path, they won't be able to understand. So that's what yeah. we're gonna try to give as many little instances or examples as we can to get people to start shifting the way that they think. Yeah, yeah. I think that paradigm shift's real important. Go ahead, Wes. If I can just tack on of course. like one or two more things to the, to the end of that. Like, and there's also a, a discussion on like magic in D and like, Disability wouldn't exist because magic, right? Spoiler alert, it would, and we have reasons why. So we're we're more than willing to talk about that. Um, and also, even if it didn't, even if you wanted to use your magical system to heal everything, to make us all typically develop not neurodivergent at all, you know, if we die, bring us back from the dead, big whoop, what kind of storytelling is that? There are no stakes to that storytelling. Do you want to be part of a story where, like, that kind of stuff doesn't matter, where difference doesn't matter? I know I don't want to be. And then another thing 
that I wanted to bring up that I wish more people knew about disability was that like we have sexualities, we can be sexual. A lot, a lot of, You're a lot of people. folks. Who knew? No, I know. Yeah, people. we're we're real. We're real people. We're hot. We have sex. Big whoop. Um. So you know, like a lot of folks either hypersexualize, which is a whole other conversation I'm not getting into, or desexualize and infantilize disability. Um. Because infantilization is a huge thing we have to deal with. People talk to me like I'm a dog all the time. It's it's ridiculous and I hate it. Um, so like another big thing is like, yes, the horny bard trope is overplayed and outdone. And, you know, like it takes a lot of work to be done right. Like there are a few instances of like professional D&D players really, you know, really knocking it out of the park with the quote horny bard, unquote. At some point, do I want to play a horny bard? Yes, specifically because that bard is going to be in a wheelchair and is still going to be rolling to seduce everybody, and that and that's that's going to be making that's going to be making waves in the community. If if we do a live stream play of like me doing a horny bard during a one shot, there's going to be so many angry comments about how no one would want to have sex with me, and I am so here for it. I am so ready for that. Like, I can prove it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, it, yeah, that, that's just another thing I wanted to add on to Rachel's wonderful comments, just yeah. because that's another big thing for me, too. I think it's really important that people understand that, you know, <laughs> just of the most visible tools that people uh, have, you know, wheelchairs are, are one of them. They're, not everybody who is in a wheelchair uses that wheelchair all the time. Yeah. It's another thing they have to understand. Right. If you're blind, Thank you. you have no sight. You know what I mean? Like, it's amazing how it's all or nothing. It, it's, it's so really, binary. It's really, you're, you know, if you're hearing impaired, it means you can't hear anything. If you're, it's like, no, there's spectrums and scales for everything. It, it is such an interesting, interesting thing to, to when, uh, you know, people just, and, and, and I also I also hope that people understand for some people using a wheelchair is a choice and for other mm -hmm. people it's not a choice right like some people have to and that's the way it is and then some people like no I I can but this is better for my life mm -hmm. um, I often talk to my students about this I say hey uh, I had somebody I worked with who was in a manual chair and they could use it just fine but when they got home, they were so tired from using the manual chair that they couldn't brush their own teeth. They couldn't feed themselves. They were just so spent uh, and they were getting older. Uh, so they were get also getting physically heavier and bigger. And so we made the clinical decision to say, Hey, let's think about a power chair. And the, they had been the mom, mom specifically had been fighting the power chair for a decade like 10 years probably had said no power mm -hmm. chair no to power chair and there's good reason clinically to not have a power chair in a lot of ways for some people it's like okay we want to keep you physically active as long as possible etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. but then at some point the person the boy actually made the decision he said no mom i actually i want to go to the mall after school with my friends i want to come home and be able to play you know nintendo without having you know my brother do all the moves for me because he couldn't even use a controller when he got home he was just so tired yeah. um and there's all sorts of other things that uh you know a lot of people just don't understand about living with a disability or or just the, the ramifications of it so i am a power wheelchair user so that like that definitely hits home for me because i did i did transition from a manual mm -hmm. wheelchair to an electric wheelchair especially when I went to like high school and university. Yeah. High schools and university campuses, especially York University, if anyone knows York, it is freaking gigantic. It's huge. Yes, it is. So I, I did not want to be like dying by the time I got to class. And like, yeah, it's true. There are a multitude of health benefits to staying in a manual wheelchair. But what folks fail to realize is there's also a multitude of health benefits to getting a power wheelchair. Like <laughs> I still get out of my chair. I still work out like regularly, yeah. get my weight down and like, you know, but he, I, he weighs 140. Yeah, I weigh 140. <laughs> <laughs> but we like, know that. 
yeah of pure you know that now. muscle that, that's gonna be in my that's gonna be in my uh wikipedia page right <laughs> official <laughs> entry as of uh, like 9 38 or whatever it was yeah <laughs> At this exact moment in history, um, they went. They weighed um, 140. But like my my point is that there 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 is no one right way to use adaptive equipment. It works differently for everyone. Um, in the future, I'm planning to write an article based on a bunch of research I've done around different uses of adaptable devices in. Uh, medieval and Renaissance Europe, and then when oh, it's awesome! And when the the what's called the bath chair was invented in England, that was like the English version of the wheelchair, and then it kind of expanded from there. Um, I don't know about stuff outside of uh, Europe because unfortunately, a lot of academic research is very Eurocentric. That's a whole other conversation. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I will certainly be speaking from like my knowledge and my reading on like European disability history in terms of the different adaptive technologies, because uh, just to provide a quick example, way before, um, like if the wheelchair is now the modern symbol of disability in medieval Europe, it was the crutch. And often right. when people couldn't use crutches, they used hand trestles, which is basically a block of wood with a handle on top of it and they'd be dragging themselves around on the street and begging for alms. So what, what, what that happens for me is, what about a rogue that is a beggar that has throwing knives under the hand trestles or the hand trestles are hand trestles of spider climb? Because if you think about it, if you're dragging yourself around all day using your arms, you're gonna be jacked as hell. So, yeah. <laughs> like, you're, right? like, here's the thing most people cannot do even do like a dead hang because they can't hang on to their own weight. Imagine doing that all the time, essentially. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, right? So, that'll be something coming out of the forts in the future. So, if you're interested, also, there were wheelchairs that looked like rolling couches. Why did we get rid of them? I would like to be <laughs> I around on a rolling lounge. couch, please. Yeah. <laughs> West, Still lounge I, everywhere. I feel She's like just I, i'm not sure about this but i feel like the romans might be another one to look at because yeah. of their combination of the the advancements combined with their vanity combined with their numbers <laughs> no i'm, I'm yeah. being serious yeah. because yeah. i mean they they started doing plastic surgery i yep. mean that's frightening but true uh they did like eyelid augmentations and try to put people's noses back on because you know fun syphilis and whatnot but if they're yeah. willing to do that it says that they're willing to experiment uh, and push forward when because they they don't just accept the way things are. They try to to find other ways around it, right? I wouldn't yeah. be surprised that they'd be a good culture to look at. I, I have I have looked I have looked at Romans a little bit. Another culture that I've looked at extensively because it relates to my spirituality is I've looked at uh, disability in Scottish folklore and yeah. Irish folklore. I have some wonderful sources that I'll be plugging on. The website that are very anti-cultural appropriation, anti-racist, and they talk about um, representations of disability in those uh, pre-Christian cultures, and it's fascinating. And I think we're we're trying to sort of get back to some of those attitudes about how disability can actually be positive. Mm. Um, I'll be sharing those on the website in the coming future as well. So please look out for those too. Very cool. Uh, Rachel, why don't you tell us about the Strata Miniatures Silent Auction? What's that going on there? What's it all about? Um, so Strata Miniatures uh, was the very first thing that we saw, um, or I should say I saw um, as looking into the Dungeon Diversity um, stuff coming out. And that's when I learned about the combat chair uh, rules by Sarah Thompson is when I saw the minis for the first time. And um, they really, um, Strata Miniatures is an amazing org uh, company that created these uh, Dungeons and Diversity line so that um, players can have these characters that use the combat wheelchair minis. And um, we wanted to work with them so bad. So I reached out 
um, to talk about a potential uh, miniature painting contest because we love all of the miniature painters that we're following on Instagram. And so we wanted to combine their amazing art with Strata's amazing miniatures. So we created this miniature painting contest. And um, unfortunately, we only had two people uh, enter. So out of the, we were, we're hoping for 10, but our amazing um, artists um, submitted two minis each. And so we'll have four painted Strata Miniatures minis um, available uh, for a silent online silent auction starting this Friday, the 18th, and we'll go until the 25th. And 100% of the proceeds goes to EDS Support UK, which is the um, charity that Sarah chose um, that 25% of all of the mini sales go to for Strata Miniatures. Pretty cool. So, yeah. That's so neat. Um, what other types of stuff in terms of advocacy do you hope to plan in the future? What do you what do you want to do? How are you gonna use your platform? That that's the big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think, Wes? What are you gonna do? Well, I'll I'll let I'll let Rachel answer this first. Um if if you have stuff ready to go or if you want me to go first, because I can. Do you do you want to go or do you want me to take it first? You go first so I can think. Okay. I mean, like we we just want to continually be pumping out content, um, pumping out articles, um, creating a space for discussion around disability in tabletop, but like fantasy in general. Um, we 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 would love to be a catalyst to see like uh, accurate and faithful disability representation of all intersectionalities. Um, be more normalized in these kind of things, especially in like science fiction stuff um, too. So we're we are gonna be hopefully using our platform for that, um, continuing to partner with some amazing people and with uh, stuff that we're not able to announce yet, we do have uh, larger projects underway that we're hoping to get elevated and out there um, to, have something concrete for people. And that's all I'm going to say about that because I don't want to say too much. Um, I must say, I have a little bit I was going to say about it that won't give too much away. Yeah, okay, go ahead. You, if you have stuff, go ahead. So basically every single element, every NPC, every mechanic, everything that we're doing for now and until the foreseeable future will be going towards something. Um, and so that's very calculated and um, it's, we have very long, large plans clearly, but everything we're doing is leading up to something huge. Could be yeah, big. We, we, will, <laughs> we will be drawing uh, from, from a writing perspective. Like we've, we've already done a lot of this, which is drawing on historical representations of individuals with disabilities being monstrous or um, closer to nature as in like, sort of flipping the script on that and reclaiming that a little bit in some of our writing, of course, being extremely nuanced with how like orcs are representative of other marginalized identities. Um, I love rolling orcs and goblins. So um, orcs and goblins do feature heavily in what we may be having. I'm just gonna stop in, you in, now here, Wes. Yeah, you can, <laughs> so, you can stop saying. me now. Um, I thought I was the you Tom Holland of our organization. I am not the Tom Holland. I didn't do that much. I didn't that do the whole me. script close enough. <laughs> so funny. Um, and, and so, Rachel, what about you? What do you hope this this platform that you have will become in the future? Um, really, what I want it to become is like just like a guide, a tool for people um, that was like, you know what, I want to create this awesome character or this awesome campaign, but I don't know where to start. I'm going to go to Forge Ahead a Party to access me because they're going to have so many ideas for us. Mm -hmm. That's, I want like it to be easier um, to be a place where people can get answers um and not feel so hesitant about creating those characters with disabilities and um, we've had so many people reach out to us on instagram um, and just like talking to us about like how um 
how to be appropriate, how to make sure not to or to avoid different tropes and things like that. So another um, thing that Wes and I have been talking about is doing some consulting things. Um, right. Where, um, it yeah. just makes sense um, that if uh, we're very knowledgeable in disability and gaming and so um, working together to help do some major consulting would be yeah. amazing for the that would That would be a dream for us. I mean, acknowledging that we're both two white presenting folks with disabilities, we'd only be consulting within our absolute lanes to consult right like even even in our own own writing we've approached cultural consultants on stuff that we don't know about but we would right. love to sort of be a bastion and a beacon for folks looking to be more adaptable and inclusive and adding disabled characters npcs to to their games and then like if folks see that and bring it to other platforms, like we're just hoping that it'll, you know, start a chain reaction to make things more commonplace. And all we have to do is just keep supporting and keep uh, growing where we can and elevating the stories of folks where we can, so. And, it, and it's already started, the chain reactions already started because, um, uh, oh, and I can't think of their the page, but there's um, an accessible terrain competition happening um, on Encounter Terrain, I believe. Um, and it's because um, one of our followers suggested it to them and now they are going to be judging it. So um, we're already like starting to like, just get those like starting to spread and, and getting those ideas of what accessibility could actually be um, in fantasy and gaming. Right. That's really cool. Um, I, you know, I think there's so much that uh, needs to be done. I tried to do this a little while ago before the um, before the whole pandemic thing happened. I had a bunch of artists and illustrators who wanted to talk to people with disabilities uh, about uh, drawing them uh, and figuring out how do I draw people, how do I represent people um, properly, and and can, you know, talking to them about what they would like to see uh, in in games, you know, whether it's a fantasy game or a modern based game or something like that. Uh, we often see very, uh, you know, kind of heavy handed, kind of tropey drawings of people from all walks of life. And the part of the reason that some of my friends who are illustrators, like, I don't, you know, I don't know how to draw people with disabilities and I don't want to insult them. How do I do that? And I was going to put something together and then, you know, everything happened the way it did. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you're interested in doing something where you talk to illustrators um, about, you know, how you want to be represented and if you could, if you have a community that would want to talk to people about that, we can make that happen. Uh, I have a lot of people. I'm just thinking yeah. about all of our conversations. The wheelchair basketball team has been talking about how to make a wheelchair basketball 2K for years um, and like how what it would take to make a wheelchair basketball video game and like all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we have we have a very large pool of individuals with disabilities that we know um, that would be very interested in doing that. Yeah, because I mean, I think it's super important to be represented correctly, right? That... Um, yeah. you know, it's not about, it's, it's, it, it's sort of funny, right? It's like, anytime you get it, it's either that, like you said, the inspiration porn or like a pity party and nobody wants either of those, but that's all we ever really it's see. A good thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know uh, why people think it's a good thing, but they do it. The, I find there's, there's a lot of either just misrepresentation or th this is rare, but it's still ridiculously awful. Just plain uh, appropriation of disabled experience. Like, especially if they make, if a character is written to become temporarily injured or something in, in a rather minor way. I've seen writers kind of absolutely play that up with like the really campy representations that they have seen. And they start telling stories from a disabled perspective that they don't really have business telling those stories from. So our, our goal is to sort of arm people with a tool of knowledge for in tabletop games, if they do want to 
include those characters that they will have the material and the knowledge to stay away from one or the other and come out with something that folks can be happy and proud of because when when the opportunity when those do come up when stuff comes out that we can be proud of as a community it makes such a difference such a difference our like our whole organization we mentioned is in essence started from a chain reaction of the uh the combat wheelchair that was released right and stuff like that so we're hoping to be that for other people to just create more good disabled representation out there that's not yeah. definitely um so let's see where can people reach you they can reach you by email right mm -hmm. uh through a party to access at gmail.com and i already put the link up but for those of you who haven't seen it yet check out everything that wes and rachel have put up at www dot a party to access dot com uh, you might see it called forge ahead uh, but that's the url right there um yeah. and uh, i mean you're not on twitter yet but when you when you decide to go out there you can be on twitter and <laughs> if you are on twitter you can follow us at uh people syrup myself i am at senfong lim erica where are you at i'm at erica weiris and again, I said already at Meeple Syrup for the show. If you like what you saw today, if you want to support us, you know what? Don't support us. I think if you, I'm going to turn that off. You should support uh, Forge Ahead. Um, check out the, oh. uh, the auction. When's how yeah. it until? It runs until the 25th. So the 18th until the 25th. Um, and that, that is all through your site. You can find it, right? Yeah, yeah, and you can also find it on our Instagram and Facebook. Like we have links to all the things on our socials as well. So if you're more socially inclined as opposed to Chrome or whatever you use, just go to our Instagrams and we will have stuff there too. And you'll be right. able to take a peep at some of the the minis that our lovely friends have given us to auction. Appar apparently, Daniel Rocky will buy it all. <gasps> oh, <laughs> that, that, that's what that's what there, right? Dennis said. So. Well, Who knows that this is true? This is going to give them something potentially like new to paint too, which is nice. Like think about the mini painters out there that are like, I'm done that set. I don't know now what. It's like my, they mean anything that can be new. People are going to be very excited by it right now. I have a feeling. And Wave Three is coming out for Strata Miniatures. And oh, if you haven't seen Wave Three yet, every single chair is like, well, shit. It's the shifting what you think of a wheelchair could be. That's um, awesome. There's, there's, there's a track chair and all these other things. So Wave Three is coming, and it's so good. It's it's okay, well, well, Dennis, just just get the chair and. Get somebody to paint it for you. Yeah. Or try or learn. There you go. Uh, do that. Chad Elkins says, excellent conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Adam Young is saying, that was a fantastic chat. Thank you. And uh, your ex-teacher will check out your website for sure. Please go look, guys. <laughs> Please go look. Um, yeah, and, and and put in a bid on the, you can get that miniature. Now, uh, well, I mean, Dennis, these are pre-painted, aren't they? They've been painted mm -hmm. already. Dennis, they've been painted already. You can get no combat wheelchair. Yeah. That's awesome. Get it. Um, what do you think about what's the one piece of final advice uh, that you would have? We'll start with Rachel for the audience. And the audience is, by most accounts, they're I'm looking at them mostly designers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's definitely publishers out there in the audience, uh, and people are already saying that they are going to go bid. Um, so, yeah, who? What would you like to tell them uh, from people at Forged Ahead to people out there who are designing games, uh, whether they're role-playing games, board games, card games, who are publishing them? What would you like them to know? If you start with accessibility first, it's so much easier. Um, whether it's building a building, building um, software, building a game, if you start with accessibility as the forefront, you create the curb cut effect, which allows everyone to have access. Right. And a lot of the times gaming, um, it's accessibility, gaming and um, act like buildings and stuff. It's always an afterthought. It's slapping a ramp on the side just to fix the accessibility or in web design that gets expensive um, having to like do it um, 
as an afterthought. Whereas if you start with accessibility, you will make such great advancements in just everything in story, in playability and replayability. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Excellent advice. What about you, Wes? What's your advice to the designers and publishers out there? Um, well, the first thing that popped in my head was if, if you're curious about how to make things accessible, um, ask. Mm -hmm. And even, even if there are, even if folks don't necessarily want to talk in that moment, there'll be someone who is willing to consult, maybe us, who knows, um, but ask for sure. And also just the reiteration that we're, we're not a monolith. Um, we're, we've tried to bring in a multitude of perspectives today, but of course we can only rely on our own. So if you are thinking about including disability and adaptability, which you should be, if you're not, why are you not thinking about that? But um, if you are, just remember that you may not be able to encompass all of disability in one thing, because that is literally impossible, but you have to start somewhere. And we are a community that thrives on helping everyone because every accommodation made for our community benefits everyone, no matter who they are. If anybody's ever used an electric door strike to open a door, you can think oh, five dollars. everybody else. <laughs> if, 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 <laughs> sorry. I was saying, if anybody has held a coffee in their hand and used their cell phone with one hand, that's universal design because of ADA accessibility on web app um, stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank ADA for that one. Yep. There's so much out there. Uh, even things like, you know, voice recognition and all that kind of stuff, oh, which yeah. we, we think of as, you know, this newfangled technology. It's like, well, it's it, it just wasn't available for real cheap before because it just yeah, wasn't that accessible. It, it needs I type with my voice. I yeah. use voice recognition. I can't type with my hands fast at all. I write essays with my voice. Yep. Oh, I and, actually do now that too, just because honestly, they think better than they can compute even with their hands or write with their yeah. hands, right? So it's amazing where that that allows them to feel like they can still be confident. You know, it's just another way of translating that. Dennis says there is never a good reason to exclude any person from gaming because of differences. Uh, and it's so important to remember that he said, thank you for reminding us. My heart feels full tonight. Thank you. Um, I want to hear more about this last one. Oh, his colleague teaches students to type with their is eyes. Is it like your cicada rhythm? Ooh, like, no, nah, it's, 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 it's the um, eye gaze eye technology. Gaze. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have, we we have a that. thing about that. We yeah, just we just, featured that actually. We just featured that on our equipment IRL. It's a low intensity light that is shined in one of the eyes and you're able to, um, based off of the way that the light moves off your eye, you're able to um, pick and select things on the screen. That's yep. cool. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And, I know of a researcher that the last time I chatted with him, which was granted a long time ago, uh, was working on developing a way for folks to type with their thoughts. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It took five minutes, but you could type. It took five minutes per word, but you could type words. So he was at that point. So he's probably a lot closer to fast thought typing now. Yeah. If anybody who's any type of like, uh, any type of either comatose or any type of, you know, whatever it is that's like disconnecting you from your, your ability from communication. to communicate. Exactly. Imagine, mm -hmm. wow, just that possibility, right? Mm -hmm. So much, so much out there. Um, Paralysis, that was the word I was looking for. I'm tired. Yeah, it's okay. So uh, this Friday, we have uh, Andy Dessa coming in at It'll be 4 a.m. his time, 8, 8, 8 p.m. our time. That's He's great. coming in from India to talk about gaming in India. Uh, Austin McKenzie and Kevin Wynn are coming in to talk about their role-playing games. Uh, Austin is the author of Valorous, and Kevin is the author of Volley Boys, which I am super in love with because it is basically uh, a sports anime <laughs> role-playing game. 
it's it's a kaiku, the volleyball game. I was gonna say there's mm-hmm. enough shows. It's about time it's an anime. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, sorry, it's an RPG. <laughs> and then if you uh, come back next Wednesday, we have one of the best in the business for videography and photography, uh, Tim Chuan, coming on to talk to us about his stuff, his his skills behind cool the stuff. lenses. He is super good. So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much to everybody who came and watched. Thank you to Rachel and Wes for coming and telling us about Forge Ahead. A party to access. I almost said a path to access. That's why I need to go check it. A path to access. Please do go check out a party to access at at partyactaccess.com. And remember to bid on the Strata Miniatures silent auction. All right. So we'll see you all later. And uh, Dennis says, good night to my new heroes. There you go. All right. You've made a fan for life, the two of you. Dennis uh, Dennis has a son who has um, different abilities. So there you go. Excellent. We'll talk to you all later. Good night. Thank you very much, Wes. Thank you, Rachel. We'll see you all 